That was a bad, bad outro. Sorry. It's okay. DJ Richard, thank you for here. Uh, welcome back. Yeah, sorry I missed yesterday, uh, two days ago. I had to check on. Did you hear what happened with Fatface Rick? Yeah, he's not doing well. Yeah, yeah, no, he's in, he's in pretty bad shape. I just got back from checking on him, but yeah. I think you got paid him to visit. Yeah, all right, yeah, so that explains, yeah. So, as he said, Fat, 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 Fat Face Rick is not in good shape. Uh, I'm traveling there this weekend to go check out him, check him out. Uh, so that's why the class on Tuesday, again, will be, uh, will be uh, remote. Uh, I'll post all, uh, details on Slack. Um, other things on the agenda for you guys. Uh, homework three, again, all the dates you're here should be correct. Homework three, we do uh, this Sunday. The midterm exam is on Thursday in class on October 13th. Um, and then project two is out now. We're having the info session tonight on Zoom as I posted on uh, Slack. That'll be at 8 p.m. And then checkpoint one will be due on October 11th, which is a Tuesday. And checkpoint two will be due on October 26, which bumped up because of fall break, uh, on uh, October 26th. All right, any questions about any of this? So again, Tuesday's class will be, be over Zoom, or, or uh, YouTube, sorry, yes. All right, let's jump into this. Okay, yes, whose question is, is Project 2 the hardest? Yes. Uh, so, <laughs> f your family, f your friends, start Project 2 right now. Uh, tr trust me. People always put, they always think, oh, Project 1 was easy, and they put off Project 2 to the end. You will not have a good time. Do not wait. Start it now. Uh, I mean, is it, is it because the projects are easier, or you've, got, or you've gotten better, right? Like, it's... Like, <laughs> Playing like what? <laughs> Playing dark. I don't know what that is. Sorry. Uh, you don't have any. <laughs> right. I don't. What am I? So we don't have time to play video games. Sorry. Yes. What, what's, what's so hard about Project Two? What's the hard part? His question is, what is hard about Project Two? Well, it's a concurrent data structure. Uh, where you have to care about things that, uh, moving around in memory. People always have a hard time. Your question is, uh, how do you manage the files in Project 2? How to open them? Yeah, no, they, like, I have to open like four files just to do work on it. Like, how, like I don't have enough like, windows on my window. Like, open Wait, are, windows. Are, are you me or is this a real question? <laughs> <laughs> is this a real question? <laughs> OK. <laughs> Uh, I mean, use an IDE or use like C line, right? Uh, IDE or Visual Studio. The C++ IDEs have gotten really good in the last 10 years, right? All right, so what's that? C line. What's that? It's free for students. If you have a .edu, it's free, all right? It works with alumni emails too, just so you know. <laughs> okay. All right, so, all right, so, so some questions about like how to make, uh, you know, how to work on bus stuff and the projects going forward. Um, we can't stress this enough. You should really be writing your own tests, right? Don't use Gradescope as, as a debugger. Don't like, you know, oh, I failed a test, make a little fix and then submit it again. Because again, as you get closer to the deadlines, the queue gets backed up in Gradescope and you're not gonna have immediate response, right? So I would encourage you to write what is called defensive programming, especially in a concurrent data structure like a B plus tree, where you wanna put asserts and, and other invariant checks all throughout the code. So that way, if like you get back a null pointer at some function, uh, you'll trap it when, it when it occurs, not like you know five functions later when it, when it hits se you know, seg faults because you passed something wrong before. So you should have write invariants, write the assertion in, in your code so that like, you know that the data you're passing around sort of one, as, you, as the data structure moves from one state to the next is correct, all right? And in terms of getting, uh, uh, you know, getting a higher score on the leaderboard. Um, we'll discuss maybe some things tonight of what you, what you can do uh, to make to make you know your your code better. Um, but I'd encourage you to use a profiler uh, like Call Grind or something or Perf. Perf would be might be an overkill for this, but Call Grind would be pretty good. Uh, and that'll basically show you where in your code you're spending all your time. And go look at that. And say, all right, am I do something stupid? What can I do to speed this up? Okay. So again, don't use Grayscope for debugging. Don't email the TAs directly for help. Please if you have questions, please post on Piazza. That way, you know, it's fair to all the students. If you have a question and then somebody else might have the same question, rather than just us just 
repeating the same answer over and over again in private emails, it's better to put this out in Piazza so everyone can see it. Okay? All right, so again, start project two. Do not wait. All right, so for today's class, I want to go over, uh, today's class, we're going to start talking about query execution, right? After all this work, we talked about the data structures, how to bring things uh, from disk into memory, how to do sorts, how to do joins. Now we're going to talk about how you actually take a query plan and, and run it and, and execute it. So we'll begin talking about the different processing models you can have in the database system as you execute queries. Then we'll talk about the access methods, basically sequential scans versus index scans. Then we'll talk about how you how do queries that modify data, what needs to happen, what bookkeeping you need to do to keep track of things. And then we'll talk about how to evaluate the, the expressions in your where clauses, having clauses, and so forth. And then we'll finish up with a quickie uh, midterm review. Okay? All right. So the first design statement we're going to have to make in our database system is to execute queries is the processing model. So a processing model is going to define how the system is going to sort of traverse the query plan tree and execute the operators. And in, in what form are they going to, or what's, what is the data that they're going to pass from one operator to the next? And am I, am I going to start at the top and go down, or am I going to start at the bottom and go up? The spoiler would be most database systems you can think about, if you ignore the data warehouse ones, are going to be using the top-down approach with the iterator model, right? Because it's, it's sort of the most simplest way for humans to reason about uh, the code. But in, we'll see some cases where, depending on the workload you're trying to execute, the iterator model may not be the, the best choice. And what we'll see on uh, next, next Tuesday's class is how to make these parallelized, right? To have, to have multiple threads or multiple processes, multiple workers uh, execute the same query at the same time, or different parts of the same query at the same time. All right? So we're going to go through each of these three approaches, the iterator, materialization, and vectorized batch model, and we'll talk about the pros and cons on each of these. All right, so the iterator model, as I said, it's the most basic one. This is what people typically implement when they build a, a database system that's not targeting uh, data warehousing or, da or data warehouse or that workloads. Uh, sometimes you see in the literature this will be called the volcano model or the, or the pipeline model. Volcano was an influential project in academia in the late 80s, early 90s by that same guy that wrote the B plus tree paper, Gertz Graffy. So he had a, uh, had a whole sort of system, and he... He wasn't the first to invent this, but he was the first to sort of codify and explain how to actually, what the iterator actual model actually means. And then he also invented techniques to make it parallelized, which we'll talk about next class. All right, so the basic idea is that every single operator in your, in your query plan, and now these are going to be physical operators, like, the, like the, what join implementation we're actually going to do, or what's, what the scan operator we're actually, we're actually going to do. The actual implementation of these are all going to provide a, a next function. And so on each invocation, the operator is going to return, when you call next on it, it's either going to return a tuple. And again, the tuple could be uh, some subset of columns, could be actually just a record ID, but some notion of a, of a tuple uh, back to the, the caller. Or if there's no more tuples to process, then it passes back a, a, a null pointer. And that just says, hey, don't, don't call next on me anymore. I, I don't have anything for you. Right? And the idea is that an operator that... Uh, it, it's a, a, a parent operator in the tree would call next on its children, and it's going to potentially pull up uh, data from the bottom of the query plan uh, until you produce the top, which is the, with the output we, we, that we return back to the client. The, uh, it's called pipeline model too, because the idea here is that you want to, in theory, you want to be able to ride along a single tuple up a pipeline in the query plan as far as you can until you ha can't do anything more with it before you go back down and get the, get the next tuple. All right, so let's look, let's look at an example of this. So we have a single join here, or a simple join query on RNS, where, where RID equals SID, and the S value is greater than 100. Uh, and then we have, the, again, this query plan here. But again, it, what I'm describing here is actually the physical operators, the physical implementation of the different operators. But visually, I'm just showing uh, the logical query plan. So normally, I don't like to show code in class, but it's kind of unavoidable here. But you can think, again, the implementation of all these operators are going to be these for loops where they call next on their children, except for the leaf nodes, the scan on RNS, where they're actually going to iterate over the tuples in, in, the, in the corresponding <laughs> target tables, right? So we're gonna, the, the way you would invoke this is that going from the top down, you call next on the root operator, and it would call the next function on its subsequent children, right? So, so the order goes like this. We start off in the, in the root operator, which is the projection. So it's going to call next on its child, 
which then invokes this function here for the join. And for this one, we're doing a hash join. So the first thing it has to do is build a hash table. So it has to iterate over the, the left child and call next on it over and over again to populate the hash table. And every time it calls next, it then goes down to this function here, which then iterates over every single tuple uh, on R, and then emits up one at a time. Again, in the iterative model, it's, it's one tuple per every next call. Then once it builds the hash table, then it goes to the next second part of, of the, the join, where it has to do the probe. So it's going to hold next on the, the right child. It goes down. And inside this, the first thing we hit is the, the filter uh, the, the filter operator. But it just iterates over every tuple on its child. So then that goes down to the, the scan. And then for every tuple in S, we emit it back up, apply the filter, or evaluate the predicate here in this step, which then spits it back up here to this loop here. And then we do our probe. And we have a match. Then we pass it up to our to its parent. Yes. Sorry, what exactly is probe? It's probe the hash table for, like for hash join. Oh, okay. Right. You build a hash table, then probe to see is the probe phase is checking to see whether you have a match. Oh, okay. If it has a match, you then you then you emit it up. If it doesn't have a match, then you just go back and get the next one. Right. So what's kind of nice about this approach is that it's uh, the operators are highly composable, right? Because the, the hash join doesn't care what, the, what its child is doing down here. Right? It could be another join. It could be another, uh, you know, another scan query, index scan. It doesn't matter. As long as all the operators implement next, then the, they're all composable. So the, I don't have a diagram to show the, the, what a pipeline looks like. But the join operator is considered a pipeline breaker, meaning I can't do, I can't, when, when its parent calls next on th this, it can't return a tuple until it sees all the tuples on the left side of the tree, because it has to build the hash table, right? So, so we're going to be in this. We're going to be in this loop here, iterating over all the tuples here to build the hash table. Now, once we build the hash table and we do the probe phase, when we call the next on this side of the tree, then this will actually be a pipeline where we can go from from the bottom all the way to the top, right? Because for every single tuple in S. Uh, as long as it evaluates the, 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 the predicate evaluates to true, which then goes up to the next one, then I probe the hash table, and as long as that's true, then I go up the next one, and then I do the projection, and then I produce the output. Right, so the pipeline in this example for, for on this side of the tree would be 5, 4, uh, 2, and 1. And so the advantage of a pipeline also means that like, I, don't have to, to, I don't have to write out any uh, intermediate results act to disk. Right, again, in, in a disk system, at every single of these, one of these steps, we could be having to spill a disk if we, if we run out of space, right? So it may be the case, like for, for you know, I go fetch one page, I get one tuple here. I can do as much work as I, as I need to do on that tuple, potentially get all the way to the output without having to write it back to disk. So as I said, this is used in almost every single database system uh, that you can think of. Um, and then this allows for this, this pipelining approach again, try to keep things in memory, uh, do as much work as you can for as long as possible. As I said, the, there's some operators that have to block uh, until all their children emit all the tuples. These are called the pipeline breakers. It's joins, the subqueries, sorting, obviously. I can't sort, I can't do a global sort on all the data until I see all the data, right? The another nice advantage to, of this approach, in addition to make engineering being simpler, is the output control is super easy. Right, because now if I have a limit clause, uh, going back to my example here, if there was a limit 10 on this, then in the top loop here, once I hit 10, I, I stop, and I don't call next anymore, and, and I'm done. All right, what are some pros and cons of this, potentially? Yes? You make a huge number of function calls. He says you make a huge, much, huge number of function calls. Yes, uh, and certainly in, um, in if everything's in memory, then yeah, that could be expensive. Uh, but if you have to spell a disk, the jump call, that's it, it's not that it, it's bad, but not like terrible. Going to disk is always worse. Yes. He says you can't optimize for things happening below you. What do you mean by that?
he says, uh, if you want to do order by with a limit, then you need to still pull all the, the data from your, from your children, uh, then sort it, then do the limit. Uh, yes, but that's somewhat unavoidable, right? Yes. I have a question. So like, um, the tree that we saw, that was like the execution plan. So here we're just assuming that the execution plan is given already and we just execute it. Um, or... Yeah, so his question is, in this, is this is a couple here, I have a SQL query. And then I somehow convert it to a tree, and then I somehow said these. This is the this is the functions we're going to call for it, right? So these like these functions here. This is what you actually would implement in the system itself. Like you would implement this in like in Bus Tub. You would have a like Project Three. You implement these things, right? The the thing that the that the, the data system is going to figure out for you is how to convert the, the 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 SQL string into an optimized plan, and that will cover after the midterm. Right? It's going to try to figure out like what should be the, the right side or the, the inner, inner table versus the outer table on the join, what join algorithm to use. Uh, in my example here, I pushed down the predicate to be below the join, right? Relational algebra it said it would actually be on the top, right? So there's a bunch of stuff. We, we assume that we have this already, yes. It's kind of hard in this class because like there's, how do I say this? There's so many different parts of the system that are all intertwined. And it's kind of like, I have to expose some things, but I, like it wouldn't make sense for me to talk about query optimization if you didn't know what join algorithms were, right? Like, so it's a tough part. All right. So the um, so we we hit a bunch of bunch of the downsides of this. Um, the the jump clause or the, the 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 function calls that sucks. But it um, the real limitation is the fact you're dealing with sort of one tuple at a time, right? Because I go fetch one thing and. I may be able to do a bunch of, uh, may, I may have to do some expensive operation where if I could have multiple tuples at the same time, I could bash them together and potentially vectorize or execute that all, all at once to amortize the cost, right? So again, this, this approach is, is it's the easiest for humans, humans to reason about. This is what people typically have implemented. Actually, this is pretty much how everybody implemented it up until maybe 20 years ago was always like this. Um, but let, let's look at some other approaches. So the next one is the materialization model. So this is, yes? Um, what happens if the method actually doesn't fit the memory? Is it it's, forward, it's, forward and five, or? So his question is, if I go back here, what happens if the hash table doesn't fit entirely in memory? Would I skip four and five, or what? Uh, do you go to four and five and do as much as you can within the memory and go back to three, or? You print, print it as print. Right, so his question is, if my hash table has to spell a disk, would I try to do four or five as much as possible before doing going up into here? No, because the iterator model wouldn't let you to do that, right? Because at no point here in, in my pseudocode do I have like, oh, is something in disk or not, right? So you would basically have to do the, uh, the, the, the data system would have to figure out ahead of time, do I think I'm going to have to spell the disk? And therefore, maybe I do the, like the recursive partitioning or the, the, the partition hash join we talked about last time, or the hybrid hash join, right? So in that case here, if I was, instead of, this is like the straight, the regular hash join, but instead of doing the, the probe phase here, when I call on the, on the right side, I could do that, that bucketing approach, spill all that out the disk, and then now do an extra step where I would join the right side and the left side together. But he, like, the database system isn't going to try to figure that out. Most systems don't try to figure that out on the fly. They try to figure it out ahead of time. And, and, it's, and, then, and then the query plan is essentially baked. OK, so the. The materialization model is, is going to be a, a bottom-up approach where uh, there isn't going to be a next function. There's, there's essentially going to be a like, MIT function that they implement that's going to, that the, when you invoke the operator, it then generates all the result that the operator would ever, ever generate and then pushes that up to uh, the, uh, its parent operator, right? And the idea is you're trying to materialize all the, the output of the result all at once, right? And of course, because now it's, it's not so going from the top down, you have to play some games of actually inlining or embedding higher level concepts or operators that are up at the top of the tree now in the lower parts, like a limit clause, for example, if, if you can. And that way you avoid having to scan too much data or push too much data in, or push too much data up, right? So I'll say this, actually meant to say this for, for all, the, all the approaches. It could just be a, a, you know, the entire tuple, the entire row with all its columns, or it could be a single column. 
and there's some additional bookkeeping mechanisms that the the data system will maintain to keep track of like in what portion of, of the of the table am I actually passing up from one upper to the next, right? So let's go back to our, our joint example here, right? So now what we have in each, you know, in all our different operators is uh, again instead of having calling next, you're just calling the output function on the uh, on his parent or, or sorry on his child. Actually, in this example, I'm going top down. You could also go go bottom up. Again, the other one. All the different ones, all the different implementations work in both directions. Uh, so this one going top down, so we call the output function on our child, and that'll be a blocking call where I'm not going to get I'm not going to get control back into this operator until I get all the, the the output from my child. So this guy here then calls output on its left side, gets this thing's going to then build a uh, a buffer or an array, a list of all the tuples, returns that up all at once. Then we can build a hash table. And then now I can go down the, the right side. This calls output on its, on its child. It gets the complete list of all the tuples. And then I push that up and push that up and so forth, right? So the, the example I was saying before about inlining, like if I have a billion tuples in S, then obviously this is stupid to like, okay, let me try to take this entire table, put it into a buffer, then pass it to my, my parent. You basically would you would know that you could inline this predicate evaluation so that as you're scanning, you would, like when you bring the tuple into memory, then you apply the filter, then put it into your output buffer, and then you skip step four here. Yes. But compared to the previous model where everything is Python, so like you only represent everything as a generator, so your parent and teacher have everything saved in memory. This thing seems to be like if you have a large table in this, then you have a lot of flat and you don't have to a lot of things. So his statement is, uh, and you use the word generator in the Python context. In the state, am I correct, Wes? Yeah. yeah. So his statement was that in the iterate approach, because it was it was a the, sort of the the Python generator uh, programming pattern with the yield function, it's sort of going at one tuple at a time. Uh, that you can that you can sort of on large tables, you can just only look at portions of the table at a time. In this approach, if you have a large table, because you have to generate all the output of the operator all at once. You could potentially thrash because you run out of memory. Yes. So does anybody really use this? This question is anybody really use this? Yes. Right. Uh, so uh, VoltDB again is, is the system that was based on the, the project I worked on when I was in grad school. Um, we have, actually I haven't been in this. We did this because um, because in in VoltDB or HStore it was an OTB system. So the uh, the leaf nodes are almost always going to be index scans. You're almost always going to get one one record at a time. Like go fetch Andy's account record. Go fetch uh, you know, GGA Mushu's account record. Like you follow the index, you get one thing, right? Uh, and so we don't want. And, and in case Azure also too, it was an in-memory system, so we didn't want to pay that function call overhead because we never go to disk. Therefore, the function call actually mattered, right? Uh, RavenDB is a document database store at at Israel. Uh, they do this because, uh, again, same thing. They're trying to target sort of operational workloads where you're going fetching a small number of things. Uh, CrateDB is, is similar. Um, now, the one exception to this is MonadB. MonadB is a uh, is an OLAP system, one of the first column store systems out of uh, CWI in the Netherlands. It's actually the same school where, where DuckDB came out of. Actually, DuckDB was a um, DuckDB started off as a fork of MonadB. It's called MonadB Lite, and then they threw it all away, and then they wrote DuckDB from scratch, uh, which is a cool system. Anyway, uh, they MonadB does this. They rely on MMAP, believe it or not, uh, and they had a bunch of papers that came out with, like to deal with like the overhead of this uh, materialization, and essentially try to push down as much of the scans as, as they can, um, and they would just let the OS swap things in and out as, as needed, and they claimed it worked well. Um, I disagree. I think it's the wrong way to do it uh, for OLAP, definitely. But they do it, uh, and I've said this in class before. And, and then somebody emailed the the creator of of this uh, of Mon MonadB. He's like, "Hey, Andy said this. You're wrong." And I was like, "So I, I had a good deal with that." Um, actually, that guy died this year. Uh, it's kind of sad. Wait, sorry. The 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 creator of MonadB, not the student. Right. <laughs> I was I wasn't trying to be funny. Martin, Martin was a good guy. He was a good guy. All right. So yeah. In my opinion, this is a bad for OLAP queries with large enemy results because you have to spell to disk. Uh, for OTP, this makes sense. 
right? But again, see, so I sort of have two extremes now. I have like the iterated model is one tuple at a time. The materialization model is all the tuples all at once, right? We actually potentially may want something in the middle. And that's what the vector is, vector, vectorized model, the vectorization model does, right? So we're still going to have a next function. But now, instead of getting one tuple, we're going to get a batch of tuples. And this is going to allow us to do uh, in the control loop of the operator, when it calls next on its child, it gets a batch, a batch of tuples. And then now, with inside that for loop, the thing that actually does whatever the work that the operator wants to do, because we're looking at multiple, multiple values of a tuple at the same time, we can do we can do a bunch of vectorized operations with SIMD to, to, to speed things up, right? So the size of the batch is going to vary on vary depending on the hardware or what the query looks like. Uh, and so I can't say like, hey, you always use the size. It you know it, it, every every system does something different. But you typically want to line the. You want to make it so that the the data actually even this is not true, like. You want it to be a line for the. Uh, you want to line the, the the sort of chunks of data that you're processing in the vectorized instructions based on the size of the registers. But the batch itself could be. Uh, you know, larger than a single SIMD register. So again, it's like there's something in the middle here. It's like not one tuple, but not all the tuples, something in the middle and, and get best performance and it varies per system. All right, so we go back to our, our example here. Basically now we have the next function, right? And it's just like before where they're passing things around. But now we see in the, the leap node in our scan, uh, if the size of our output array is is larger than, than whatever our, our, we want our max size to be, then we, we emit it out, right? So this is like, again, the yield function in a Python generator, right? And again, everything, everything works just like before. So this is the way to build a data warehouse today, or OLAP system. Pretty much every single system that, that is designed specifically for, for analytical workloads uh, is going to support this. Because, again, you get the vectorization within, inside the for loop, whatever, whatever you're actually, whatever you, the work it is you're trying to do inside of this, right? And pretty much every system since, uh, I mean, since the late 2000s worked this way. So the system that actually sort of invented this was vectorwise. Again, this came out of the same school from MoonADB and DuckDB. So they had a, a, a fork of MoonADB called X100. They said, hey, look, you actually want to do all this vectorized stuff and move things in batches. The vectorwise got bought by Actian. The co-founder of vectorwise left, and then he was the co-founder of Snowflake. And so this, this, this is essentially also how, how Snowflake works today as well. Uh, so you know, I list other systems like SQL Server, DB2, and Oracle. Obviously, these systems are super, super old, right? DB2 is 1983, Oracle is like 1978, whatever. And obviously, back then, they didn't have SIMD, and they didn't implement the vectorization model. But they have sort of specialized engines that you can graft on to the regular iterator model engine that operates on rows. Do they have engines that are, that are specialized to work on uh, columnar data using the vectorized model? OK? So the, again, the main takeaway would be for, for general purpose systems, the iterative model is probably the best approach. For like very specific OHP systems, I think the materialization model is better. And then for analytical workloads, actually, whether it's in disk or in, or in memory, the vectorized model is better for analytical, analytical workloads. Yes? With so many database systems out there, as a customer, how do you choose which database systems to go with? <laughs> So, so your first question is, how does the customer choose? Well, there's so many different systems out there. How does somebody choose? Uh, and then your second question is, why are there so many databases? Yeah, it's like, why don't we have like, a couple major ones and all these like, smaller ones? How do you even like, get a piece of the market if like, as a company you can just go with like, an established database system? Uh, let's see here. So as, as I've said many times before, I love databases. Um, and my hobby project is this website. Uh, DBDIO, which is the, the database of databases. Uh, so I'm currently aware of 862. Uh, there's way more than that. Um, there's, there's a few more hobby ones that I'm missing. Uh, but the, I mean, your question is like, why is there so many? This is a, it's a ton of money, right? Snowflake went IPO. Databricks is going to IPO next next you know, next year sometime. Oh, same point. Uh, like, there's a lot of money. People have a lot of data. And there's always somebody out there that says, OK, these existing systems don't do what I need. And they're always trying to build a specialized one. So is the market, is this sustainable to have all these different systems? Um, 
probably no. I think there's a there's a Gartner report that says a bunch of these are going to start going under in the next three years, two years. Uh, so where am I going with this? There's a lot of money made. So people always think you do something better. And then oftentimes what happens too is like systems exist, people use them, and then uh, and then they sort of get bought out by another company and they get sort of relegated to like maintenance mode. So then you got to figure out how to move to something else. And that's when people have to like build something new. I, there's been a ton, I mean, 800 databases, a lot of them. There's, I think there's a lot of money. Got a question over here. It, no, SIMD means single instruction and multiple data. So, like, I mean, I, I, I have slides from the advanced class I could show. Basically, if I want to add two numbers together, one plus one, that could be one instruction. But if I want to add two vectors of numbers together, then that also is a single instruction if I put them in these specialized registers. Oh, so, so, so how, how does that relate to being better for analytical, like, data? Because you're doing, his question is, how is it, how, why is SIMD better for analytical, analytical queries? Because I'm doing long scans on, on single columns, right? I want to find all the customers that that live live in you know this county. Assuming I don't have an index, I want to scan through. So rather than doing the iterator model of getting one tuple at a time, then run you know run my where clause, if clause to do my check. If it's if it's true, then produce the output. What if I can get four four tuples at the same time in a vectorized model? Then load them up into the SIMD registers, single instruction to do the comparison. I get back the result all at once, and, then, and, I, and I pass the ones that match up. So it's actually somewhat similar to the iterator model, just that you use the special instruction, like the special like capability of the processor to run this. So his statement is this: this is basically like the iterator model, except that I'm running special instructions. Well, I, like, I'm not showing any SIMD here inside these for loops. I'm just saying if you actually implement it, you would implement this in SIMD to speed things up. But like the high level, like the high level concept of the processing model is indifferent of what the actual implementation is, whether it's vectorized or like whether it's like you know using hardware accelerators or not. It's just I want to get the idea of like again, you could pass one tuple at a time, all the tuples at a time, or something in between. And if you do something in between, you you can get this advantage of SIMD. Yes. Are right, we going down down a rabbit hole here? Uh, his question is, do people implement uh, these things with CUDA? Yes. So there are uh, GPU accelerated databases. I can't remember which one hand offhand uses CUDA. I think it's Brightlight out of the UK. Uh, but yes, they, they would implement these things. You could implement this down in the GPU with CUDA. Yes. I actually think they're a bad idea, but they exist. And we, we go to the database to databases. You, you can click like which databases you GPUs, and it'll tell you. Yes. What I think it's a bad idea. All right, rabbit hole. Uh, we, <laughs> all right, real quickly, I'll just say it's a bad idea because um, the the data exists where on disk or in memory, right? So if it's on disk, then I got to fetch it into memory and then bring it back down to the GPU, do any processing on it, and then bring the result back up, right? So there's NVLink or there's the new uh, CLX. Or there's there's new stuff, new hardware can make that go faster. Uh, but oftentimes, a well-written CPU-based generator or execution engine will outperform the GPU one because you don't pay that transfer cost. That's the basic idea. Um, and again, so I'll, I can post a link of this in, in the uh, on Piazza. But we run the seminar series uh, you know, on, on Mondays and back before the pandemic. Uh, I ran one. This is this is this is this is just general stuff, uh, but I ran one specifically on hardware accelerator databases, right? So we had a bunch of these companies come, and, and this is GPU. This has been this has been renamed to OmniSide, then they got renamed again to HeavyDB. But these all guys are all GPU ones, right? Uh, and then the Swarm sixty four was an FPGA. They got they basically nobody wanted FPGA accelerator database, so, so then they they switched to software only. And then they got bought by peanuts for peanuts. Uh, but right, your question was, why is that I think it's a bad idea? Like, have you heard of any of these? No, right? Uh, and, and, and when they came to give a talk, uh, we, they would show, oh, look how much faster we are because we're using CUDA or down the GPU versus like you know, Greenplum, which is 
a fork of Postgres from a few years ago. And we say, okay, great. Is that because it's the GPU or just because you rewrote everything and, and didn't pay the legacy overhead of, of Greenplum? And they didn't know, right? Uh, so I will say BlazingDB got renamed to Blazing SQL. Uh, this one of all these, this one actually made the most sense because it was basically, if I was going to shove data down into like TensorFlow or PyTorch in the GPU, then on the way down to the GPU, I could do filtering on the GPU like with SQL. And that, to me, that made the most sense. They got, they basically closed shop and then they uh, formed a new company uh, with the guy that was doing Apache Arrow, the guy that invented uh, Python Pandas. They took him plus the, uh, plus the Blazing SQL guys out of Peru, plus the guy that was doing NVIDIA Rapids. They mashed them together and they're building a new system and that's called Voltron Data. Uh, and we, we can cover that one later too. Arrow, it's, based, it's part of the Apache Arrow project. I'm way on a tangent here. I apologize. All right, cool. Um, sorry, let's come back. Okay. All right, so then I sort of mentioned this as well. You, you can have sort of processing in both directions. For this class, it's not going to matter too much. Uh, assume that most systems are going top down. There are other systems that go bottom up. And this, you can do this, sort of think of this as like the the, the pipeline approach, you can be very careful about aligning your memory to fit or do, if you do bottom up uh, or sort of bottom to the top, you can be very careful about putting data in specific CPU registers and get even, even better performance than just uh, you know, keeping things in memory. Um, and there's a system out of Germany called Hyper um, that Tableau bought that, that, that does this. But again, most systems are gonna, gonna go top to, top to bottom. All right. So let's talk about the access methods now. So this is stuff we basically have already covered most of the semester, right? We said this is the way that at the leaf nodes in our query plan, this is either we scan the table or scan the index or potentially scan multiple index, multiple indexes, right? Uh, systems like Oracle have a bunch of different names for these things like a heap scan, partition range scan, a row scan ID or row ID scan. But at the end of the day, it's either scanning a table or you're scanning an index. And the table could be like a real table, like, like something you created with a call create table. It could be a result of a, of a, of a inter, inter, sort of intermediate query or, or nested query within your own query that you're trying to run. It could be like a materialized view where you sort of pre-compute a query and put the results in a temp space, right? But again, because our, uh, our operators are composable, the upper parts of the system don't care necessarily where, where the data came from, right? So these access methods are not defined in relational algebra. This is something we have to you know, extend relational algebra with to actually have to say what the implementation or how we're actually gonna, gonna do this, actually implement this. Right? So again, we're talking about the, the accesses, the access of the sort of the base tables or some, some, some something that looks like a table or an index at the bottom. At the end of the day, it basically like, it, you only have three choices. So sequential scan, we've already covered. Again, this is just iterating uh, over every single page in the table. And again, you don't access things directly on disk. You go through the buffer pool. You say, I want this page. It's responsible for going out to disk and bring it to memory into a frame and then hand you back the pointer of where it's located. And then you do whatever you want the, inside your, your scan operator. Do whatever you want inside the for loop. You know, evaluate a predicate, compute some aggregation, whatever you want. Uh, and then you, you produce the result back up uh, to, to your, your, your parent operator, right? And the way this basically works is that the inside the scan operator, you have this what is called a cursor where you keep track of uh, what's the last page I looked at and what's the last slot I looked at if I'm, if I'm doing a slot of pages. Right, so that way if I'm calling, if it's the iterator model and I call next, or sorry, my parent calls next on me and I have to then emit a tuple back up, or in, again, Python generator it's to yield, you emit a result back up. When I call next again, I want to pick up where I left off. So it's in the operator, you maintain some local state to say what's the last, what's the last thing I looked at and that would be called a cursor. So there's not really a lot of things we can do to make the scan itself go faster. Like I fetch a page and then I bring it to memory and then I have to look at the data. Um, and this is oftentimes the worst thing you can possibly do in a database system, uh, but it's like the fallback option. So if I don't have any indexes, I don't have any pre-computed uh, data, I can always just scan the table, uh, the, the raw pages themselves and produce my result. Um, and yeah, it's the worst thing to do, often because the disk is slow, it's gonna trash our buffer pool tracking, right? It's, it's scan flooding. 
Uh, but there are some things we can do to make this a little faster. Right? And there's things we, most of these things we've already covered, right? We've already talked how to prefetching in the buffer pool, right? If I know I'm doing sequential scan on a table and I can prefetch a bunch of the, the pages ahead of time while I'm processing the first page so that when it comes back to get the next page, it's already in memory. The buffer pool bypass we talked about where I can have a little uh, side memory space where I don't trash my buffer pool. Uh, it's just for this one query, I bring my page in, put it through this, this private memory, and, and then again, I don't, I don't break the LRU stuff. Parallel queries we'll talk about next class. Heap clustering is the, the, the index clustering technique where the, the data is pre-sorted based on an index. Late materialization we talked about before. Um, but the new one I want to mention is, uh, is data skipping. And again, data, so data skipping, the basic idea is that we want to, I mean, it's just, it's not, we want to skip data. We want to try to produce the result for the query without having to read all the data, right? And there's a lossy and lossless approach to doing this. The lossy approach is to do approximate queries. Again, lossy means that I may, since I'm not going to look at all the data, I may actually get uh, incorrect results, but that might be okay. Right, again, think of like MP3, MP4. It's trying to compress the, the audiovisual uh, data in such a way that we as humans can't detect the, the degradation, or the, the loss loss, rather than like being raw data. So the idea of an approximate query is we can have a sample of the data, uh, or si either already existing, or we sample it and we run the query and we do the scan, uh, where we can compute some aggregation or compute some, compute some result that is close enough. And I'm okay with that, right? If I want to say how many people visited my website and I'm getting like a million users visit in a day, but it might, I, instead of looking at exactly all those 1 million clicks or, or, or visitors, I just take a sample and try to approximate it from, and then maybe I get off by a thousand. That's probably okay, right? So there are some systems that support a uh, limited amount of approximate queries. Right. And again, these are typically done in aggregations, like give me approximate count, approximate uh, you know, min, max, and so forth, right? So things like Snowflake, uh, BigQuery, Databricks, and Oracle, like they will have special keywords where you can say, I want an approximate count. And they maybe they maintain an internal data structure, uh, like a hyper log log or a sketch or so forth, Sim similar to like a probabilistic data structure, like a bloom filter. They maintain that underneath the covers uh, and they use that to produce the, produce the thought for the scan. Systems like BlinkDB, which is a uh, which is an academic system out of Berkeley, and then ComputeDB, which was called Snappy Data, but then they got bought. These are systems where they're designed specifically to do only approximate queries. And you can maybe potentially say, I you can you can give it like, give me an approximate answer for this query within some amount of statistical error, and they they figure that out for you. Right. So again, this allows you to skip data because you don't need to scan everything. A losses approach would be zone maps, and this one is way more common. And the basic idea here is that uh, within a, uh, in a in a sort of set of data, uh, with either, within like a, you know multiple pages or a single page or a single column, you can pre-compute a bunch of aggregations on that column, and so that when your query runs, you can ch actually just the, the the where calls will check the zone map to see whether the the predicate actually even could even possibly find something in that column, and then if if no, then it just skips it entirely. Right, so I'm using the word term zone, zone maps. If you if you Google zone maps database, you'll you end up mostly documentation from Oracle. As far as I can tell, this was invented by Natiza, which was which was another FPGA hardware accelerator database from the 2000s. IBM bought them, killed it off because nobody wanted FPGAs, right? Uh, and but but this is pretty much how everybody does this. They might not, they might not they might not just call it zone maps. Or if you're familiar with like Parquet or Orc files, uh, we'll talk about this when we call, talk about cloud databases. They maintain this, this metadata for you, right? So it works like this. So say this is our original data on a single column, and then I'll compute a zone map where for on this column, I'll have all my, my the standard aggregates I could I, I, I would potentially compute, min, max, average, sum, and count, right? And you would do this for every single column. Now, in my example here, I only have uh, five entries. That's super small. In uh, in like something like a parquet file or in a, at a, in a column store database, you can think of this being like 10 megabyte or 100 megabyte blocks, right? So then my query shows up, uh, select star from table where value is greater than 600. So rather than, this, than doing a sequential scan on the, on the original data, 
I just go look in the in the um, in the zone map, right? Value is greater than 600. I go look at the max value. It's 400. So therefore, I would know that there couldn't be there couldn't possibly be a value that's greater than 600. So I just skip this thing entirely. So as I said, th this is super common in, in a lot in a lot of systems today, um, especially in the cloud system, because you can you can go fetch the zone map. Uh, you know, that's going to be way smaller than trying to bring in you know, the entire column and the, the entire data set. Snowflake does this too. Snowflake should be listed there. That's one of the big optimizations that they do. Now, obviously, the the larger your the larger your your sort of collection of data that you build a zone map on, the larger it is, the more uh, the less selective it's going to be, and you may end up going uh, still have to go read about everything, right? So there's this trade of how big you want to make the blocks and have a zone map based on it versus how uh, how useful it's going to be, right? Like if I have a billion entries uh, and I have one zone map for it, you know, a query like this would be I couldn't use the zone map because that there probably would be a value greater than 600, and I had to go scan everything. But if I broke it up into smaller chunks, or in the case of Snowflake's case, they actually sort things ahead of time, uh, then the zone maps can be very uh, very helpful in filtering things out. All right, so that's sequential scans. All right, the other choice is to do index scans, and we'll talk about a single index scan, and then we'll talk about uh, a multi-index scan. So the the database is going to figure out ahead of time what index it should use to find the result that you need for, for, your, for your query. This goes back to the question he had about like, oh, how do I, how does the data system know what, you know, what, you know, uh, what the query plan is going to be, what the execution is going to be ahead of time. It's similarly, like, the, there's this thing called the query optimizer or the planner. Uh, some systems call it the compiler, which we'll talk about if, why they call it like that. But it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a remnant of the 1970s. But it basically, again, takes a SQL query, converts it to a physical plan. So part of that generation of the physical plan is then figuring out what index you want to use. So there's a bunch of different criteria it's going to use to figure out what index you want, right? Uh, you know, all, all these things here, which we'll cover in lecture 14. But like one obvious thing is like what attributes are the index based on, right? If my where clause is, is on looking for column A and B, but my index is on C, then that index is useless for me. So the, the query optimizer, the data will know, don't pick that index, right? Obviously, again, you know, if it's if it's a bunch of uh, you know greater than less than uh, queries, then I can't use a hash table index if I have one of them. So all this additional information about what's actually the index look like, and what 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 operations or queries you can run on it, the data system has that baked inside and figure that out for you, right? So suppose so let's work through a quick scenario of showing what kind of choice you can make uh, in, in the system. So let's say we have a query here, select start from students, where age is less than 30. The home department is computer science, and the country, their home country is the United States. So say in our example here, we have a single table of 100 tuples, and we have two indexes, one on the age and one on the department. So we're trying to figure out, again, what index we actually should use at this point, in, in this example here. So say in scenario one, uh, there's 99 people under the age of 30, but only two people in the computer science department. Then in that case, we want to pick the index on, the, on, on what department they're in because that's going to be more selective. That's going to throw away more data quickly uh, when we do the, you know, the index lookup. Right? But if it's the flip side, if there's 99 people in the CS department uh, and only two people under 30, which is definitely not true for, for Carnegie Mellon, um, then the, the age index will be better because there's fewer people under the age of 30. So if I, for, this, for this particular where clause, if I use that, that index, then I'll, I'll be able to throw away as much data as I can, or more, more data I can more quickly, right? So again, this is what the data is trying to, trying to figure out. I have a bunch of indexes. I, I look at my where clause. I look at what the, the query is trying to do. I look at what the indexes actually can support, and I pick one versus the other. And again, the index scan is just like the sequential scan where I, I probe the index with my iterator that you're building in project two, and you call next on that, and it produces results, and then you shove that up to the, uh, the, the, your parent operator. So now, what if there's a scenario where both indexes potentially could be really good, right? So this is called a multi-index scan. And the idea here is that the, da the data system says, hey, I think the, this one index is not that great, and this other index is not that great either, but the, actually the combination of the two of them will help me then get, you know, get to the result I want more quickly, right? 
so most of the higher end systems, the systems that have been around for a while, will support this. Pretty much all the, the major commercial systems, Oracle DB2, SQL Server, they'll do this. Postgres does this as well, but they're going to call it a bitmap scan because uh, the output of the, of the index scan will be a bitmap and then they take the intersection of it. And my SQL, for whatever reason, they call this an in index merge operation. But the, the basic idea is the same. So we're going to figure out all the indexes we want to look at. We're going to do whatever the portion of the where clause for our scan on each index. And then they're going to produce uh, the set of record IDs that match each, each individual index. And then we're going to combine them together uh, using either a unit or intersection based on whether we have a conjunction or a dis disjunction in our where clause. And then we go retrieve the records, and if there's any additional filtering we need to do, uh, because there was you know, something in our where clause that couldn't be satisfied by the indexes, we go fetch the original tuples uh, that are specified by our bitmap, and uh, do, do, do the additional predicate scan or predicate evaluation, and then produce a result up above. So I realize my hand gestures aren't helping here, so let's go through an example. So same query we had before, students less than 30 in the CS department in the country US. So we, uh, we're going to first retrieve all the record IDs from the, from the, the age index, where there's less than 30. Then we're going to retrieve all the record IDs from the department uh, index, where the department equals CS. And then we take the intersection of the two of them. Uh, and then we then do additional filtering on the, on the country. All right, so it looks like this. So the, in, our, in our operating implementation, we, we go grab this index. We do our scan. We get, we get a bunch of record IDs. And this could either just be a set of record IDs. could be a sorted list. In the case of Postgres, they actually make, it's a bitmap, right? where every bit corresponds to every single possible tuple you could have in the, uh, in the, uh, in the, in the table. And then I get my record IDs from the, the department. I take the intersection of them, because uh, I have its and clauses. So it's, 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 it's a conjunction. Then I go fetch the actual tuples that come out in the intersection. Then I check check my additional predicate on the country, and then then any tuple that matches that then then gets shoved up to uh, my parent operator. So the point I'm trying to make here is that just because the in the scan node when I showed uh, in the examples before in the processing models it seemed like it was one for loop, and inside that for loop I'm iterating over a table or or, or an index and it's producing one result. I could, could do a bunch of extra for loops down below. Uh, to do multiple in probes on index, then do then do the, uh, the you know the the intersection or the union of them, and then I start emitting tuples up. And again, this works because again the because we've modularized the query plan into these separate operators, they're composable. So the up above doesn't doesn't need to know doesn't need to care how you actually produce the tuples. It just takes whatever whatever the the operator spits out, whatever child spits out. So if, when you, if you ever run explain on, on Postgres, you might see say a bitmap scan, and you're like, hey, how does what is that going on? How, you know, what is actually going on? Because Postgres doesn't support bitmap indexes, they really mean the multi-index scan. All right, the last thing we got to talk about is, or for queries, is modification queries. Again, these are insert, update, deletes, uh, truncates, which basically delete all the t delete all the tuples in a table. That's typically implemented as like drop table and then re-add it. Right, because it's easier than just scanning the, you know, you're scanning through the table and deleting every single thing. Um, so, for these guys, the way it's going to work is that the whatever its children are below it, they're responsible for telling the um, de telling these insert, update, delete operators what they want to modify. Right. So think of like an update query that has a where clause. Below that's just another 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 scan operator, either index scan or sequential scan doing whatever additional predicates it wants, and then it's going to pass up, here's the record ID or some portion of the data, here's the things I want you to modify. And then inside of that update operator, it, it then it makes the change. And then the output of these operators can, can vary. It could either just be a record ID, say, hey, here's the thing I deleted or inserted or, or updated, or it could actually be the, the actual entire tuple itself. Uh, and you get this when you use the returning clause. Like, you can call it update query, and normally, update query just says, "Here's the number of tuples I updated." But if you add the returning clause, it'll pass back. Here's the here's the modified versions of, of the tuples I generated. Upsearch also works the same way, right? Upsearch is just if uh, update something if it exists, if not, insert it. So 
the, uh, as I said, the, the, for update delete, the child operators pass the record IDs for the target tables they want. Um, and then for these guys, we're, we're also going to have to maintain additional metadata about here's the tuples that I've seen before, here's the tuples that I've modified, right? To avoid modifying the same tuple multiple times within one operator implementation. For inserts, the two choices for implementation are to either materialize the entire tuple you're going to insert within the insert operator itself, uh, which I think is what, how we do this in, in bus tub, right? So like the insert operator is responsible for saying, okay, how do I put the tuples together and then I know what tuple, I'm, put the, the attributes for the tuple together and then insert it into some, uh, insert into some table. The alternative, which is the better choice, is to have the the insert operator take whatever the child operator gives it the, you know, for the, you know, the tuple values and insert it into the target table. Because if you do the second one here, that's how you implement basically select into. Because you have a select query, it does whatever it needs to do in the query plan below, and then whatever is fed into the insert operator from below it, from its child, then just gets inserted into the table. So I want to talk about one quick example or problem that could occur if you don't keep track of your uh, what tuples you've modified. And so for this one here, say we have a uh, table on, uh, called people that has a bunch of people, like employees, and, and their salary. And then I have a query here when I want to give everyone a $100 raise if they make less than uh, $1,100, right? So uh, say now in my, in my update operator, I'm going to call next on my child. It goes down below and does the index scan, and it's going to find all the employees where they're uh, where their salary is less than 1100 And if everybody matches, then I produce the result. So the way this is going to work here, uh, sort of above this for loop, is the setup on the index iterator. So I know what my scan is going to be. I, I traverse the index. Now I get an iterator. Now I'm going to walk along, along the leaf nodes here. And say the first match is me, uh, and I make $999. So that gets emitted up now inside, inside of our for loop here. I then add, I then uh, remove it from the index. Right, because I'm going to change its value, and this index is based on the, the value I'm changing. So you have to do a delete. Then I up, update the update the salary, uh, and then I put it back in the new value back in. Right, but then uh, now I keep scanning along, and what am I going to find? The thing I just just updated and started back in. Right, so I'd find now the updated version of Andy. It satisfies my predicate because it's less than 1100. And it would get passed up here. And then I would give myself a second raise, which is surprisingly <laughs> um, But we did take that one offline, right? So this is bad, right? I don't want to do this. <laughs> What's that? You saying, I do want to do this? Or? Like, well, it, how do I say this? The, thing, the high level definition of the queries is give everybody who has, makes less than this amount a $100 raise. And so semantically, this is incorrect because we're giving this one tuple two raises or implementing its value twice, right? So this is actually an example of a very famous problem called the Halloween problem. There's actually a Wikipedia article based on this. Um, and it basically comes down to it's an anomaly that occurs in a, in a, in a database system when the, an update operation changes the physical location of, of a tuple, uh, either in, in the index or in the table itself. And because I'm trying to scan along in my, my leaf node operator, uh, or my access method, trying to scan along, uh, I may end up seeing that tuple again. Because where my cursor was, it got put, put to a new location that's physically ahead of it. So as I scan along, I'm going to see it. Right? So this, was, this has nothing to do with, like, the, the example is not based on anything with, with the holiday Halloween. So this was discovered by these researchers at IBM that were building the, one of the first relational databases called System R. Uh, they came upon, came upon this problem uh, on a Friday at the, at the end of the day. I'm like, hey, this is kind of hard. How do we fix it? And the one person basically said, oh, it's Halloween. Let's screw it. Let's, let's, let's go party, and we'll, we'll deal with it on Monday, right? And for whatever reason, they called it the Halloween party because of that, right? So the way we, we, we can solve this is that now inside of our scan operator, we have to keep track of, again, additional state that says, here's the, here's the, uh, the tuples that I've seen, or the record IDs of the tuples I've seen so far, or the record IDs of the, uh, of the, um, of the tuples that I've modified. 
or like you know, you know it's either as a, the physical record ID or like the primary key or so forth, right? Because again, if it moves, then the record ID could, could actually change, right? But it's actually essential additional metadata that knows that within this query, I've seen this tuple before, therefore I don't need to update again. There'll be some additional metadata that we'll talk about when we talk about transactions that we keep track of, like here's the tuples I modify within my transaction, which, which could be multiple queries. But in that case, going back here, if, if I if I ran this query twice in my transaction, then it's okay to give you know Andy a raise twice because you ran the query uh, twice. But in the, the again semantics of this query, when you run it by itself, you shouldn't give a person a raise twice. All right. So this is something that you also have to handle in I think Bus Hub for Project Three, and just keep keeping track of what what you've seen before. All right. Any questions about access methods? Sequential scan is the default option. Uh, there's some things you can do to speed that up. Parallelization is usually the, the best approach, but the zone maps make a big difference too. Uh, index scan can either be for a single index or multiple indexes, and then you intersect or unionize the, the bitmap result. Yes? Can you explain the difference between choice one and choice two? Uh, sorry. This one? Yeah. So the question is, like, what's the difference between choice one and choice two? So choice two is the easy, easiest one to understand because it's like I I take the take whatever my child gives me and I just insert it to the table. But think about also like when you write an insert query, you have like a value list. Something needs to then convert that value list into an actual tuple itself. And you could have a separate materialized operator, which doesn't exist in the relation algebra. Like you'd implement it as a materialized operator that then takes those param those input parameters, converts the tuple, and then shoves it up. Or the insert operator could implement it itself. And in bus up, I think we, we do the first one, but it, it really should be the second. Because again, because these operators are composable, the insert operator doesn't need to know that it, it was a materialized operator or a scan operator below it. It just takes whatever is given to it and insert it. OK, so the last thing to talk about is expression evaluation. So in our SQL query, we're going to have where clauses having clauses, uh, projection lists, they, they essentially all work the same way, uh, and where they're going to be represented as an expression tree. And the nodes of the tree are going to represent the different types of expression operators you could have. Right? So just, there's, a, there's a tree for the query plan itself with the, you know, the join operators and the scan operators and so forth. And then within each of those operators in the query plan tree, there also could be multiple expression trees that you then use to evaluate, the, again, these, these, these predicates. So in our example here, we have a join. Uh, on RNS, where RID equals SID and S value is greater than 100. Uh, and you would represent the, these two predicates together like this. Um, it, this is a join, so you actually would not combine them together, but for simplicity, uh, the diagram assumed that it is. Right? And, it's, and essentially, what happens is again, at runtime, the data system is going to walk this tree. You, know, go, you, know, you have the conjunction at the top, the AND, go down this side, you see an equal operator. Go down this side, get the RID value. Go down this side, get the SID value. Pop, pop that back up here. Do the comparison. If that equals true, then you pass, you know, actually, whatever the result is of the evaluation, you pass that up to the end. And obviously, you can implement short circuiting, short circuiting like if, if it returns false, so you don't go back down the other side, right? This is essentially how all, all these systems are, are going to represent these things. Uh, so let's see how it actually works. So I haven't taught you prepared statements yet. But basically, think of a prepared statement as a way to tell the data system, hey, I'm going to run this query a lot. Uh, give, it like a, an, I, I give it a name so that I can call it again as if it's a function and I pass in parameters uh, just, just based on that name instead of, re instead of repeating the query. Right? So I add this prepare keyword, prepare XXX as, and then my select query. So basically, there will now be a, a handle called XXX for my, for my connection that I can then invoke like a function to pass in parameter. And then this dollar sign one here is uh, is SQL parlance to say here's a, a placeholder for a parameter that's going to be passed in, right? So uh, I take my where clause here, s dot value equals dollar sign parameter, like the first attribute I'm given, or first parameter I'm given, plus nine, right? And so you would represent that uh, in a tree structure like this. So now, when I when I run my query. I do my scan, whether it's a index scan or keep it simple. Let's say it's a sequential scan. For every single tuple, as I scan along, I basically have to traverse this tree. So I start at the top. I see my equal sign. I go down the left. This says attribute.s value. 
So now I have some pointer in my current execution context that says, this is the tuple that I'm actually looking at. So I go now look in the catalog and say, OK, well, I want s value. That's the second attribute, and it's an integer. So I know how to jump to the second attribute and then produce the output uh, 1,000. Then I, I go back up here, traverse down this here. Now I have a parameter uh, placeholder, planner, parameter expression operator. I look at my list of query parameters that have been passed in to, to the query. It's, it's 991. Produce that output, shove that up to the addition. It goes down the other side. I get the constant 9, shove that up, then do the addition, produce the result, shove that up here, do, do the comparison, and equals true. Right? Hey, I have a billion tuples. I'm going to do this tree traversal for all, all 1 billion tuples. Why is that slow? I guess it's obvious. Because you, you know, you're, 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 you're traversing this tree. Uh, it's for modern CPUs, this is bad because it's uh, it's it's you know it's not deterministic branching, right? Where I you know if if this thing evaluates to actually say you know, say evaluates to this is false, actually say I have more stuff here. Maybe this is too simple, but like sometimes there'll be an if clause would go down this path. Sometimes there'll be another path, right? All that's non deterministic. The 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 you know modern CPUs don't like that. They like things going in in, in predictable paths. Right, so this is this is also pretty much how most systems will implement. Actually, pretty much all systems will implement expression evaluation in the very beginning. Right, this is how Postgres originally does it. How MySQL version does it. This is how pretty much everyone everyone does it. Uh, the way to optimize this though is to basically do just a time compilation or cogen. Uh, and this this one you only see in sort of the high end systems, especially in the OLAP OLAP data warehouses. Uh, and actually, Postgres supports this as well. We, we can see, see, see it work in a demo. But the basic idea is that because we're going to be doing this, essentially the same logic over and over again, uh, instead of do, traversing the tree, which again is, is a it's a modular where I could, you know, I, the, the equal sign operator doesn't even care what's coming down uh, below it, right? As long as it gets produced data in the right type, right? Then it can do the comparison, but it doesn't care how you got the value, right? But if I'm doing this logic over and over again, instead of traversing the tree, uh, I can essentially cogen a function or it's some simple expressions that do exactly the logic that this expression is doing, run that through your favorite compiler, GCC, Clang, LLVM, whatever you want, and then now it's going to produce machine code as a shared object. So now when I do my evaluation on the query on a tuple, I pass in pointers to the tuple, right, so it knows how to jump to different offsets. But it doesn't have to tr do that tree traversal. It literally just invokes like this function, right? Value equals one. That'll get inlined into to the, the query plan execution, uh, and this will be super super fast. So I'm, what I'm showing here is how just time compilation for expressions. Uh, in the advanced class, we'll talk about how to do just time compilation for the entire query plan. So actually, the, the query plan tree itself, we we could cogen and run that in, in a similar manner. So as I said, Postgres actually supports this, uh, which is super awesome. So let's do a quick demo and see the performance benefit you can get from it. So I pre-generate a table that has uh, 50 million tuples, or just integers, um, and just, just random integers. Right, so select star from fake data. Limit one, right? So it's just it's just a giant list of, of of random integers like this, right? So let me turn off or make sure I run PG Prewarm. This is gonna make this is gonna guarantee that everything, basically, again, takes the entire table, make sure it fits every, everything's already in the buffer pool. So first, I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run the query without this just-in-time compilation. So I'll, I'll tell Postgres to turn it off, and my query is gonna be a simple aggregation. Uh, select count, select count star on my table, but then in my where clause I have like you know value times value greater than 100, and then I have a bunch of modular arithmetic to see whether it's a power of two or uh, sorry not power of two that it's uh, divided by two or divided by four, or multiple two or four, right? There you go. All right, so it took uh, five seconds, right? And you see, it did, all it did was sequential scan and then applied this filter here. 
and it, again, it tells you that uh, shared hit equals, you know, this number here means er everything's in memory, right? And it took uh, 5.8 seconds. So now let me run the same query again, but this time with just that compilation turned on. And now it took three seconds. So I shaved off two seconds. And here you see Postgres tells you that the, that it was able to inline and compiled uh, the expressions inside of it. And it actually gives you the breakdown of how much time it spent at these different steps, right? So Postgres is going to have its own internal cost model that says, well, I know how much data I think I'm going to have to access, and it can determine whether it makes sense to even uh, uh, just time compile the expression, right? Because if the compilation time took 36 milliseconds, but my query runs at one second, then that's a bad trade-off, right? Again, this is the great thing about SQL and the racial, and, and the relational model is this is like super advanced uh, feature that we're, we're co-genning query expressions uh, in, in Postgres. Like, I don't have to know anything about that in my in my SQL query. I just said, hey, do do this select count star, and the agent figures out what's the best way to execute this. Not just like you know what access method should I use, but like how do I actually implement the expressions, right? This is amazing. Like to me, th th this is this is super awesome. That like. The average Joe Schmo programmer doesn't need to know any that this thing even exists, but they they get the benefit of it, right? So if I go back in theory now, if I put like a limit one, I'm not sure why it's taking so long. Uh, Postgres did oh because it's limit one because I want one output result, but if I go back here. Right, in this case here, I, it's the same predicate I had before with my limit clause. And granted, it's not a count star, but Postgres said, I'm not going to compile it. And I didn't, didn't change anything. It figured it out for me. Any questions? All right, cool. Um, so, again, the conclusion here is we, we saw how we take a single query plan and we can execute it in multiple ways. Uh, and most database systems are going to rely on use index scans as much as possible. The OLAP systems, some of them don't support any indexes, like Vertica, uh, and they do sequential scans and everything, but they pre-sorted data. But again, from the um, from the perspective of you know somebody writing SQL, they don't need to know, don't need to care. The database system will figure that out for you. And we showed how expression trees are flexible, but they're slow. And then modern systems can use just-in-time compilation uh, to speed things up, potentially. Okay. All right. So next class, we'll, t we'll do the midterm exam next, but or midterm uh, review. Next class will be parallel execution. Basically, how do we take the all the constructs we talked about this semester and run run them in parallel and either multiple threads, multiple workers, and that'll be also a precursor when we talk about distributed databases, where it's basically the same thing as parallel query execution, but now they're on on separate machines. But now we, we got to worry about work. when you go to distributed, you got to worry about the network. Uh, which is why we want to w w wait for that. Put that off as long as possible, OK? All right, midterm. Who's taking it? You guys. What is it? The midterm exam. Where is it? Here. When is it? Thursday, October 16th at uh, a regular time. Why? That video will, get, will give you the, the, the meaning of life, so you can watch that. Um, and then the midterm guide is available. I posted this on Piazza. Go there. The practice exam is there, although I posted the practice exam on, on Piazza. Yes? Yeah, thirteenth. Yes, it's next Thursday. <laughs> All right, Thursday's a good. Sixteenth is Sunday. Every time. All right, thirteenth. Show up. Uh, so you need to bring your CMU ID. You got to bring your calculator. Uh, and then the it's open notes, but you you have to write your notes on handwritten on a sort of one regular sheet of paper. You can write front and back. You can write as small as you want. That's fine. What I don't want is. Uh, taking the slides, shrinking them down, and printing them out, right? I want to be handwritten, because you'll get something out of it more than just copying and pasting things on. Um, someone pointed out on uh, Piazza that in 2022, most people don't have a calculator. So yes, you could use your phone as, as a calculator. That'll be fine. What? <laughs> your phone, what, sorry? My phone doesn't do logs. Your phone doesn't do logs? You, yeah, you can't do logarithms on your phone? I guess I can Uh, again, this is Carnegie Mellon. Uh, 
I've said you guys are really smart. I'm pretty sure you can figure out how to get, do logs on your phone. Um, all right, so please don't bring. You have a real question? Yes. Can the handwritten note be on a tablet? You can write. The question is can the handwritten note be on a tablet and printed out? Yes. I mean, come on. This is. I mean. I, be reasonable here, okay? All right. It, sorry. The point of the exercise by handwriting, like, I think this, this, the psychology shows that, like, if you handwrite something, you retain it more than just printing things out. So I'm trying to do that. Okay. So uh, this list, I, this is the first time I've, again, taught this class uh, in person since uh, 2019. Uh, so we haven't had this problem when it was all remote. Uh, but every year, things get worse. Uh, so these are real things people brought before, and please don't repeat this. Do not bring live animals. Uh, do not bring your wet laundry. We had one kid one year brought, like, he, like, raced in the exam, had his wet laundry, and he had to start putting it out in chairs. Uh, <laughs> and then the one year, the, the kid brought a, a, like, you get these, like, votive candles, like, religious candles, like, from, like, bodegas. But it had Jennifer Lopez on it. Like, don't do that. Um, that's a fire hazard. Okay? All right. Uh, what do you guys need to know? Obviously, the rational model, the integrity constraints, relational algebra. Uh, should I understand the symbols, how to compose these things together. Uh, understand, like, is it, uh, are there duplicates or not in relation to algebra, right? Th these are the things, th the basics that we covered in the first day of class. Uh, for SQL, we're obviously not going to ask you questions like, hey, take, you know, take this prompt and write SQL, because then we got to, it's impossible to grade uh, without running it. Uh, but we obviously will show you, uh, as we did in the practice exam, we will show you SQL queries and not explain what it actually does. It's up for you, you know, you should know what SQL is at this point, right? So we talked about, obviously, where clauses, the basic type to, uh, of, of, of queries you could have, output control, and then joins, aggregations, and common table expressions. I've left out window functions on purpose. Um, so take that as a hint. For the database storage itself, we talked about how the different buffer pool management policies you could have, LRU, LRUK, clock. Uh, we talked about what do, what do the files actually look like on disk, how do you represent the, you know, the page directory and so forth. Then what do the pages actually look like themselves? Like the, there's two main approaches, slotted pages and the log structured approach, right? What are the pros and cons of these, of these different methods? For our hash tables, we talked about static hashing, uh, linear probe, Robin Hood, and cuckoo hashing. You to understand basically what the, how these, these, these hashing schemes work. And for dynamic hashing, obviously extendable hashing and, and linear hashing. So understand, again, like in extendable hashing, the difference between global death versus local death, the overflow changes, overflow chains, and then litter hashing, inserting splits, and overflow, ch overflow chains as well. Yes? Do you have questions on whether like, this SQL syntax is valid? Because there's some annoying things. No. His question is, am I going to have, like, hey, is this, SQL, is this SQL query real? No. Okay. That's a move. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> right? Because it's like, <laughs> yeah. It's really annoying to kind of catch Yeah, it. like, why would, why would it, like, yeah, that'd be a terrible question. I'm not doing that. Yes. Yes. The question is, are we going to have to differentiate between the different database systems, like for SQL? Yeah, or just in general? No, okay, so the question is, like, am, like, am I going to ask questions like, hey, does Postgres do this, and does MySQL do that? No. Because it's the high-level concepts that I care about. The reason why I keep always mentioning, like, hey, Postgres does this, MySQL does that, DB does that, is, like, I just want to sort of show that, like, the things I'm saying aren't just random stuff in a textbook, these are actually things that people implement. So, but like the nuances that I don't care about. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Tree indexes, we only did really covered, covered B plus trees, uh, insertion, deletion, split to merge, all the standard operations. Latch crabbing and lat latch coupling, and some of the optimizations we talked about going along the leaf nodes. Uh, for sorting, we pretty much only talked about sort of merge sort, uh, heap sort. There's not much to ask there. Um, but basically, similar to the homework, the cost to sort data, different data sets with different amount of number of buffers, right? For joins, uh, the three basic types, nested loop, uh, sort, merge, join, hash join, and then all the variants of, of each of them. And the kind of questions we would ask you would be like, the execution costs or trade-offs between these different joint algorithms in different uh, conditions for different queries. And then query processing, which is literally today, so I can't obviously ask too deep things, but the different processing models, the, the advantages and disadvantages of them, 
and then the, the three different access method types, sequential scan, index scan, and multi-index scan. Yes? So is Tuesday's lecture not an exam? Tuesday, the question is, is Tuesday's lecture not an exam? That is correct. Yes. Yes? Is the format of the exam fairly similar to the practice? The question is, is the format of the exam similar to the practice? Yes. All right, parallel execution. Again, no class on Tuesday next week because I, I got to see Fat Face Rick, and then I'll see you at the exam on Thursday. Hit it. Dang cold, it's taking its toll. I got a pack of zigzags, but ain't got nothing to roll. Hit the bus spot, let me cop a dub, show some love. Three for 50, is you with me? What I'm speaking of? I'm in the studio at nine, so it's some. And I'm not leaving till I'm finished with my next song. Fucking with that dope, you know it make my legs flow. Just grab a double deuce or two and then I'm good to go. Yo, I get this shit done and get it over with. Cause the whole world's waiting for another Tears Town Street sound. Town a motherfucker if you label me a fake. I'm like a cobra and I'm down with the super snakes.